want, you can use run on. It's opt in. So we're not forcing anyone, and Toronto could then opt in. So we already do that, for example, for online voting and phone voting. Any city in Ontario, if they want to, can use online voting. It's allowed. It's not mandated. It's allowed. The ideal situation, I think, would be if the province actually took the first step. Don't even wait for a city to ask. Give cities a toolkit. Give them options. So I'm working on a separate campaign called Local Choice. The website's localchoice.ca. And we're advocating for uh, enabling legislation that will allow any municipality to use parties, term limits, runoff voting, proportional representation, a few others I forget. Is that including, uh, so that's separate from uh, It's part of Better Ballots. Oh, it's part of Better Ballots. Yeah, so Better Ballots was, an, was a project that facilitated a dialogue about 14 proposals without advocating for them, just saying, here's 14 things other cities do, why aren't we talking about it? Uh, like boroughs, Montreal, weekend voting in Vancouver, uh, etc. Um, and meetings, rabbit, more accessible meetings, right? In municipalities. Some of them have other meetings. That, no, that's fourth wall. I know, I'm doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> Better Bouse was specifically voting for. Okay. And then Rabbit is an advocacy campaign that came out of one of those proposals. And then Local Choice is a spin-off of Better Ballots asking for enabling legislation for a whole bunch of those options. Okay. So and all those things have websites. Yeah. Okay, but the but it's they're spin-offs of I said they all kinda of come from Better Ballots. Well not Fourth Wall. Fourth Wall is just a spin-off from my head. Okay. But um, Local Choice and Rabbit are both in different ways spin-offs of um, Better Ballots. Um, it grew um, out of England. And it was mostly an anti-highway movement, so they were like putting in some new major highways through uh, through through neighborhoods. And it was, I guess, a movement trying to restore sustainability. So also like to not have highways in the neighborhoods, but also just like stop building highways. We need more sustainable transportation. And they would just have these huge, um, friendly and fun street parties rather than a protest. They would take over the street and have a celebration, which is kind of a twist on the usual kind of protest. And these things were, were enormous, thousands of people, like dancing in the street without a permit illegally, but having a party. Yeah. Which totally like counters the usual perception we have of what a protest is, which is the angry black block smashing windows. Yeah. And we were hearing stories like, um, like they would have people on stilts, really tall stilts, and um, with, a fake, with a dress down over the stilts, which left enough room for someone to hide underneath and then using a jackhammer, they would make a hole in the highway and plant a little tree. <laughs> and no, the police wouldn't know what's happening because the, the drumming is so loud and the stilts. And then when the party left, there's a tree in the middle of the highway. Wow. So they were being, just doing a lot of creative stuff. So in 1998, they, they did a call uh, calling for a global street party on May 16th, yeah. asking um, in cities all over the world for people to organize these spontaneous street parties. So I thought, okay, sure. I've never done anything like this before. Yeah. And you did it for Toronto. So I organized Toronto's gl global street party. And we had hundreds of people out. May 16th, 1998. May 16th, 1998. Uh, Bloor and Brunswick. Yeah. We shut down the street for a few hours. We had people dancing. We had DJs. There were arrests, though. It got confrontational. Were you there? Not that one. Not that one? <coughs> the other one. 99? 2000? Down here. Okay. The grass. Oh, the grass. 2000. Yeah, so we did, we did, I organized three of them. And the, um, he's talking about, the grass was brought by Tuker Gomberg. Does that name mean anything to you? Gomberg. Tuker Gomberg, he's, uh, he's my, my mentor, really. And he ran for mayor in the year 2000 against Mel Asman, because no one else was running against Mel. Someone had to do it. Yeah. So uh, Tuker ran, and he was a master of creative activism and getting messages into the media using clever tactics. Um, he buried my car in 1997. Um, he was wanted to organize a uh, event to commemorate the hundredth year anniversary of the first pedestrian fatality from a motorized vehicle. And the guy's name was Henry Bliss, and he had stepped off a streetcar and got hit by a car. Where? In New York, I think. And 
he, but he wanted the media to pay attention. So he organized a funeral service for all pedestrian fatalities at the hands of the automobile. Yeah. And how do you do that? By burying a car. Wow. So he sent out an email saying, I'm looking, does anyone have a car? Yeah. I had just moved downtown from the suburbs. Yeah. I didn't need a car anymore. I had a car because I had a t-shirt business in a factory. I needed to buy big boxes of t-shirts. Yeah. So I said, okay, you can borrow my car. So he dug a hole in someone's front lawn. Uh, in, in, Did you know? Uh, yeah, I knew what it was about. I thought he was crazy. Yeah. I was like, who's going to show up to this? Yeah. Buried the car with the front end sticking up. And then he read a eulogy surrounded by friends, all wearing suits, and he read this really well written eulogy to, essentially to the car yeah. um, in front of a wall of media. Wow. Print cameras, video cameras, and notebooks like this. Yeah. And I was like, wow, you can get your stories into the media with creative organizing. So I mean, everything I've done has really flowed from him. And the irony of that event, of him doing the eulogy, is that he took his own life. Uh, like about 10 years later, and I gave his eulogy uh, at that, and I helped organize his memorial. What part of the city was he from? Uh, he was actually not originally from Toronto, he was a city councillor in Edmonton, yeah. and then he ran for office uh, in Montreal, and he did a lot of environmental organizing in Toronto, Edmonton, and Montreal. Yeah, but when he was in Toronto, he lived on, um, what's it called, Rush Home, I think? Oh, yeah. Rush Home? Is that it? One over, a few over. What's it called? Um, Concord? No. With Angela? Yeah, but it wasn't Concord. But it wasn't Russian. Then he was, um, Havelock? Was yeah, I, Havelock, I lived, Havelock. Yeah, because he was on my street. Yeah. Was that it was a really fun campaign. Yeah. Is that like, was that a style that you wanted to adopt? Um, not in, in its entirety. Yeah. One of the hardest tricks in activism is um, transforming your anger into a smile. And he wasn't always good at that. Like his anger sh came through. Yeah. Um, I've gotten good at keeping it in. Okay. Even anger, anger is like anger is often the driving force of activism. Yeah. You don't want it to be the the outward emotional framing Was of, it your, for of you? your message. Oh, like in when I started, yeah. yeah. And the reason I'm passionate about this exhibit is because when I first got involved with activism, I didn't know how to engage with the system. Yeah. So when I wanted to see more bike lanes, I would buy paint and paint bike lanes. Yeah. It seemed like the only way. Yeah. If I didn't like you know, a certain type of billboard, I would throw paint at them. You know, yeah. It was a, a gut reaction. Since then I've learned that you can actually advocate um, in this building. That's what this building is for. Yeah. And you can change bylaws about signs. And you can advocate for bike lanes that won't get washed away with the rain. Well, Jarvis, Jarvis money. Yeah. But, uh, but I don't think it will, because we're actually running a really broad creative campaign to, to, to save Jarvis. And that is supposed to be... Uh, That'll... Um, make back. It's likely that there'll be motions in October to reopen it. They would have needed two-thirds vote to reopen it up until this week, actually. It's yeah. been a year now. Yeah. There you go. Um, Going back to like North York, growing up in North York, was there were some of the roots of activism really starting there? Like your family life? I it wasn't a politicized family. Okay. So no, not really. I was just always interested in wanting to make the world better, which I think we all have to some degree when we're young. But most people kind of just move on and like get focused on like building a career in school and and sports or whatever. And I was just felt really strongly about wanting to find out how to make the world better. I still haven't quite figured it out, but I figured out enough that, that it, I've been able to make a small difference and maybe inspire others to do so as well. You're stuck with the local, the local politics though, yeah. right? Like when you talk about like wanting to make the world better, do you think it starts? Yeah, I mean there is that phrase, think global, act local. Yeah. But also the, in Toronto, local isn't just local, it's a completely different type of politics. So in Vancouver and Montreal, and, and most cities in the world, you have political parties in City Hall. Yeah. This place is amazing because it's there's 45 political parties. Yeah. And um, no one here can be whipped. No one here is told how to vote by anyone. Well, they're there's, told. However. Yeah, yeah it's true. But, but, yeah. but obviously, we, we know that that thumb doesn't have any power anymore. Now, to be fair, uh, theoretically, executive members, I guess, can be whipped because they could lose their executive. 
spots. But we've even seen that that doesn't hold up. And, and who cares if you get kicked off executive? In a party system, if you vote against the party, you lose your seats, you lose your nomination. And that's a really big threat. So this place is more fun as a community organizer because people are actually thinking up there. If you go to Queen's Park, you have essentially you know, a few hundred robots who are being told how to vote. The Canadian government is 308 people who stand up when they're told to stand up. That's it. And in the back rooms, there are people who make policy decisions based on market research. It's very uninspiring. And here you've got, I mean, you do have some people who vote very predictably right, left. Um, not that they're not putting thought into it, but you kind of know where they're going to go. I'm more interested in the councillors who can actually see them in a council meeting, listening to both sides and actually not being sure what to do. Yeah. And being torn, and saying, oh, they're both, they're both kind of making sense. Yeah. And no one's telling me what to do, so I need to figure this out now. Yeah. That's amazing. There won't be any other mayor for the next four years. Right. So if you want to talk to the mayor, um, he's the only person you could talk to. And, and, and I want to be talking to the mayor, because I do advocacy. Yeah. So I'm going to try and work with him and see what happens. And I got attacked from like left and right. Well, actually, just from left. <laughs> um, uh, now Magazine attacked me. Uh, people attacked me on, on Twitter, on, on, on my blog. Essentially saying, you know, how dare you work with this, with this evil man. And there are a lot of policies I don't agree with, with, with the mayor. Um, but in terms of civic engagement and seeing democracy through the lens of citizens are supreme like he really believes that yeah. and he he, he he talks about that a lot I don't think he's implemented it that well in this, enough ways that I'd like to see and for me the turning point last year was the week where Jarvis happened and Pride and those were both examples of in my opinion him not really trying to offer any olive branches and trying to be the mayor for everyone he was just like kind of telling the city to fuck off. Right? Has the so, mayor's office or the mayor himself? Um, well, I'm in a band with the mayor's receptionist, oh. with uh, Tom. Oh, yeah. Do you know Tom? Uh, yeah, I've been with him. He's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I know those guys. I've actually known Rob for a while. Rob Ford was one of the most supportive counselors of um, City Idol, oh, which I did yeah. in 2006. Was he really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, I remember so we did, we did, we did, wor we did workshops here. Yeah. Where we walked our candidates. Um, you know about this stuff? I was on the walk. <laughs> on the walk. There's there's good video of this. Probably your video online. Um, we talked to Glenn, to Baron Maker, and others, and we we booked a committee room and invited counselors to come and speak to our candidates. Rob Ford showed up. Yeah. He has nothing to gain from it. He's. I don't think he was thinking of running for mayor at the time. This is 2006. And he gave a really good speech to the candidates, saying, don't let anyone tell you you shouldn't run or that you can't win. You go out there, you knock on doors. And then we had a session at, at uh, City TV with a journalist named uh, Adam Vaughn. <laughs> and um, Rob Ford came down in the studio. And we had a panel of me, Royce and James, Rob Ford, Deanne Taylor, and there was a fifth one there, someone. Sorry. Anyways, and Rob sat there for like an hour and a half and like did this interactive thing with our candidates. Wow. He was totally into it. So have you guys He's he doesn't he doesn't make a lot of public appearances as you were, as you know. <laughs> if he came down here, he'd be scrummed. Yeah. Right. So he doesn't. Yeah. Well, if he announced, well. Well, yeah, word would spread. I mean, it's the rotunda, right? Like yeah. so. No, he hasn't been here. His staff have been here. Have they been to far yeah, Tom. Tom came to 401. He was one of the first people to come. Okay. Um, Andrew Pask had a little walkthrough. Who isn't technically staff right now, but might be. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think Mark's interested in this, but I mean, it's been a pretty busy week for them. Yeah. So on the one hand, I thought it was a smart idea to book the exhibit on the same week as council because they'd actually be in the building. Yeah. But I forgot that they're actually their heads just. I didn't think there'd be much happening on a summer meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I was very wrong. Yeah, this is the last one before. Yeah, I was like, oh, who's going to move big, you know, controversial motions in July? Yeah. Well, what do you mean? PowerPoint version, where I just go and I do some handouts and I walk through the whole thing in PowerPoint. And, and I did that well, right? at uh, Carleton University in, uh, in uh, Minnesota. That was really fun. Really progressive college. A bunch of hippies. 
Oh, really? Yeah. How do you get the word out? But like in a really like fancy idea. like Harry Potter school environment, like it was kind of neat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm basically something It was like Harry Potter meets Berkeley or something. How do I what? How, do you, how many cities have you... Oh, there's a list on my website, and it's actually not the full list. I've probably presented Fourth Wall to about 40 audiences, adding up to thousands of people. And some of the groups are very large and influential. I presented it to the Planning Institute of British Columbia, um, the Association, uh, it's, what's it, um, not AMO, oh, they're called Awesome or Awesome? I call them Awesome. Yeah. They're called Awesome. Yeah. Organization of Small, the Ontario Small Urban Municipalities. Or, I don't know, organization of smaller groups? Awesome. Awesome. Do you still want to do that? Like, do you want to take it? Yeah, I don't get paid for this. Like, no one hired me to do this. Yeah. Um, Margie's, Margie Zeidler from Urban Space provided a space for the first exhibit. Okay. And she funded um, the actual printing of the boards. And she funded a um, the designer, Adam Harris, who made the exhibit look all pretty. Everything. Atkinson Foundation gave me some money which allowed me to hire a researcher. But those were all one time grants, and now I'm just. It's like it's. Uh, it's pigeon hat. Is there anything eye opening that they sort of. You know, a certain appetite that they have that you weren't aware of? Well, we did, um, we did the comment cards as an experiment. Yeah. I mean, because the whole point of the exhibit is that people should have a voice. We're like breaking the fourth wall. Uh, is about people speaking through the fourth wall. So I didn't want the exhibit to have a fourth wall. So we, we had this idea of both the comic cards and the voting wall. Without knowing if anyone would do either. Yeah. It could have backfired. It could have just kind of shown that people actually are apathetic. It's like no one's using the comment cards. Mm -hmm. So the good news is there's been tons of comments. We didn't put them all up. It's, it's Yeah, absolutely. Take as many as you want. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Um, there's been lots of comments and they've been really intelligent. And we had a team of volunteers who actually typed them all up from the first installation. And the voting board, you can see people who are putting thought into it. They're not just putting stickers everywhere. Some, some of the choices have way more stickers than others. So that's been neat. People, well, first of all, people are excited. They're tweeting about it. They're showing off. They're even coming back with groups. Municipal Affairs and Housing was, was here. The clerk's office, the city clerk's office, sent a big group. So that was really inspiring. And the thing with Toronto is city staff want to move forward on this, but it takes a long time because the bureaucracy is so big. Back burner project. I have a very large back burner. Uh, hey, how's it going? Hey, thanks again for dinner last night. You're a sweetheart. You brought me a veggie dog, David Haynes. Um, <laughs> There's so many people here who we know on Twitter but like never meet. Yeah. Um, I met Chai Cube yesterday. I mean, a lot of my work has been obviously based downtown, and I am, I would say, economically left-leaning, although I try, I try and be pretty evidence-based and not partisan. Um, but the people I know socially are the downtown councillors. So my first voting reform project was in grade 12. What happened? I wanted to run for high school president. Yeah. And I had a great campaign slogan, Mez for Prez. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was told that I wasn't allowed to run. And I had just been learning in all my history courses about how, you know, we have a democracy and people died for democracy and, and anyone can put their name forward in an election and it's up to the people to decide who we want to represent us. So this is my first chance to see, you know, to try it out. Yeah. And I was told, yeah, you're, you don't qualify. I was like, why? He said, well, your grades are too low. And I thought, well, if you want to set standards for the administration, that's fine. But this is the student president. It should be totally up to the students. And if they want someone with low grades to be the president, why should the administration care? Yeah. 
And I had an even better argument, which was that people with straight A's study a lot. You don't have time for student council, yeah. right? Because they're always reading and writing. And if you look at my grades, you'll clearly see that I have a lot of free time on my hands. So I should be a great student council president. They didn't go for that. Um, so I started a petition. You know, that we the students think we should be able to decide who our president is, not being filtered through the administration selection process. And I got about hundreds, four or five hundred, I don't know, like hundreds of signatures. Yeah. The only person who wouldn't sign it was my girlfriend at the time. That's a whole other thing. It's still a grudge. Yeah. Um, but it didn't change. I wasn't able to change it. Because it's high school is in a democracy. So was that a did that spark something? Oh yeah. Well, well that's what you uh, just to go back to what you were saying before about how it's hard to get people engaged. I mean, people were happy to sign the petition. Yeah. And people actually felt kind of strongly about it. So I mean, look at Montreal right now, right? I mean, when people feel strongly about an issue and are for whatever reason convinced that their action could change the outcome, they get involved. Yeah. And young people who we often portray as being the most apathetic are actually the most likely to get on the streets and get involved. Yeah. Right? Lots of big social movements started on campus. Right. Where all the apathetic people are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't, are you can't use the word youth and apathy together anymore yeah. after what's happening in Quebec, right? I mean, it's a joke. The notion of what activism is, and it usually has a negative connotation. Yeah. It's the black bloc. It's the throwing things. It's the yelling at police. Um, but this is really what I do. Yeah. So how would you characterize it? What term would you use? Well, my business card says community choreography. Which I like it. Yeah. So it's community organizing, but with a, with a twist, with a creative twist. Everything I do has an element of either kind of performance, um, or at least a, a heavy emphasis on branding and aesthetics. I mean, what do you think about the work that Dave does? It's extremely important because he is able to be, to use the uh, word, a double connector. He's able to interpret for the people in power to the people who have no power, and he's able to speak for the people who have no power to the people in power. So he has both input and influence. He can influence the conversation, and he has been able to encourage others. For example, Rami Tybello and uh, Jonathan Goldsby and others. Um, I saw the excitement that they had when they were telling, Rami was telling uh, Mez, uh, illegal signs, I got the website up, it's going to be great, and, and I'm like, what? And uh, that was during a photo shoot for Toronto Life, and Rami was all excited about this right. project. I forgot. Is that on video, him saying that? Um, it was right in front of me, and I was taking the photographs. So he was so excited. I'm like, Rami, what are you talking about? And really, Mez had nothing directly to do with it, yeah. but it had everything to do with Rami feeling empowered that, yeah, you know, I can do something. And in the end, the bylaw got changed, and we have a city beautification billboard fee the money uh from used to be illegal billboards yeah. now goes into art so we earmarked yeah, no, so I about that when it first went up. so i i so think we got involved through the public space i mean goldsby the first time he ever came to city hall was the the Toronto public space committee yeah that's yeah. how we got started right? yeah so i mean it created a space where people felt comfortable walking through the doors here, yeah. which this place doesn't do on its own. It doesn't invite people in. So that's what you're doing. Partially, yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, anytime. Um, so I, I'm definitely not done. I don't know what I'm doing next. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of
Kelly, Kelly. Allows you to have a better election where you can have a runoff and make sure that the winner actually has 50%. But it's an instant runoff. You don't have to come back and vote again. Are you going to ask it? I'm going to ask you the question, Dave. Uh, how do you feel at this point of your community choreography career? Um, even calling it a career seems strange to me because I never, I never set out on a career path. I've just been trying to make the world better in my own way and trying to learn how politics works and how to get more people involved with it. Um, I don't even know if it is a career, but I want to just keep doing what I'm doing. I'm meeting new people all the time. I'm reaching a larger audience, both in terms of influencing decision makers and pe reaching people in the public, and I think I'm out of time. And so uh, I hope you join me. Dave Meslin, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah.